Hello, human peoples. You're listening to the podcast network of Gamefully Unemployed. Support us and gain access to great exclusive podcasts like Fox Mulder is a Maniac, Tom and Jeff Watch Batman, Star Trek The Next Futurama, and our latest show, Spiel Boys. Head over to patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. We do game streaming, movie nights with our patrons every Friday night, and you can even commission your own podcast about anything you want. Literally anything, within reason, and we have to do it. You are quite frankly out of excuses not to go visit patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. That's patreon.com slash G-A-M-E-F-U-L-L-Y unemployed, which is spelled like it sounds. We're doing great. We're doing so good. So good. Yeah. Because that was the hard uh, part. That was. (laughs) It's it's all easy after this. It's going to be great. It's all gravy from here on out. (laughs) Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Bell. My name is Tom Ryman. And I am professional podcast guest and part-time author, Jason Pargin. Welcome. Welcome. And, and we just watched, I saw the devil, <laughs> but I didn't see the deputy. I don't, I don't is know. Is that I'm what sorry. you're, oh, I'm that's, so sorry. that's the direction you're I'm taking s- it. I'm so fucking Listen, sorry. Everybody. I saw the devil. What? <laughs> I said I saw the. De- I was we were just playing yeah. with the pre- Listen, man. Oh, okay. Wait, so we're, I'm, we're all assholes. Just here. saying okay. in a different way. I don't know. All right. I saw the devil. <laughs> let's let's begin the podcast. Yeah, I should probably do that. <laughs> this this bit has died. This bit exploded in the hangar. <laughs> Let me begin with a with an apology. Uh, there are people out there who listen to on your list of podcasts you listen to. It's all of the former crack people. It's this show, and it's Sean Baby Show, and it's Alex Schmidt, and all of those. There's uh, this week you might be hearing me on about fifteen different podcasts. <laughs> why is that? Because Jason, it is what, what, finally, uh, what's happening. This tell, week? Us, tell us why you're on your grind. Book release week after uh, ten straight months of promoting the pre-orders of the book. The book is finally out on shelves where you can see its big lime green cover. Four years after the last John Dies at the End series book came out. This one's called If This Book Exists, You're in the Wrong Universe. And so this is the week when I carpet bomb everyone who will allow me to talk on their show with appearances. Uh, to try because the first week's sales are what basically determines whether or not the publisher and the bookstores and everyone else will continue to support the book or declare it dead. That is similar to Hollywood in that fashion and that the opening weekend, except in rare cases, the opening weekend means a lot here. The opening week, uh, if you're going to make any kind of a bestseller list, it's because of what you sold that week. And then, as with all things in our media environment, it is quickly forgotten just mere seconds later. Yep. <laughs> Something you spent years making, two years writing a book, and people will briefly notice it, and then they will move on. So we have to we have to seize the moment. You'll have a two hour window on Google, and then that'll be yep. it. Like ah, yeah. So it's two years well spent. <laughs> Meanwhile, right. when I when I go to the bookstore to see if they've got my book out, which is a thing that I do. I think all authors do that. See how prominently they've placed it. Um, they will have an entire quarter of the store roped off for in just Harry Potter merchandise and costumes and, and Halloween gear and ornaments and, of course, the books, but also the board games and everything else. Uh, so there are there's a few powerhouse authors who get like 75 percent of the of the shelf space and the rest of us are just hoping for a, a whisper of of please just put it just put it in the new release section face out for like one hour. Give me you're, one are, hour. You're, <laughs> you're fighting over Stephen King's table scraps. Right. What? What? Are there any laws against uh, titling your book Harry Potter and the, and then whatever your <laughs> yeah. title wants to be? Because <laughs> uh, that, I'm sure, that's my suggestion. I'm sure there's not a single law against that. Yeah, you could probably no. do that. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's fine. For Christmas a couple of years ago, for a friend, I got... Uh, three books I bought off Amazon from author Stephen R. King. Uh, hmm. Pseudonym, <laughs> self, self-published author. That is a pseudonym, and the R is very small on the cover. 
beautiful. And these are very bad, very short horror novels that this person, <laughs> because like, hey, there is no law against yeah. someone else being named Stephen, you know, and they, they've got the middle initial there to separate it. I'm, but still, you can pr- actually, I'm still proud of that guy. I don't, I'm not mad at him. <laughs> you can Google it right now. All you people listening, go to Amazon. I'm sure you can still find them unless they've all been pulled down since then. But they, you could see the user reviews from people who were mad. <laughs> Somehow I thought. I imagine people reading it and then like, like slowly turning the book around, rereading the name and being like, oh, you see, son of a bitch. Seeing the book jacket photo. <laughs> yeah. Just some Typos dude that looks like stuff. Jim Henson or something. <laughs> Uh, I have to actually momentarily pause the podcast to see if Stephen R. King's books uh, are still on Amazon. Because now I'm curious if they have ever punished this person for that. Because obviously I'm rooting for him. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm pro Stephen R. King. (laughs) Oh, it auto-completes to Stephen R. King when you type. Yes, he is still on here. Uh, He has got (sighs) a book with over a thousand reviews on it from 2016. (laughs) Are they positive? I see. I've got to. Yeah, they, they are. And now I've got to see because obviously I know what the one star reviews say. Let's see what the five star reviews say. Is SK like- is back. <laughs> <laughs> His last few books. My favorite author does it again. Fa- fast delivery and in excellent condition. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's they're oh, just, what they're a just bummer reviewing review. Amazon. Stephen King the is a wonderful. The quality of the book. Stephen King is a wonderful writer. Very scary. These stories gave me chills. Oh no! Love Some King. of them are Worth Stephen it. King fans. Gosh, I I hope so. Or though, man, I also love it if there's just a whole swarm of people that are purely Stephen R. King fans. And in fact, man, wouldn't it be great if I scrolled backward and it turns out this guy's been writing since like 1968 that he was first. <laughs> He's the Stephen King. Yeah. The Stephen yeah. King glommed onto his success. Like the day I found out that Hydrox cookies came before Oreo, there was Oreo who ripped them off. And then, Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. And yes, Hydrox predates them. And I love that they just stuck with it. It's like, no, screw you. We're not going away. <laughs> yeah we deserve to do? be here yeah, we were first uh anyway <laughs> it's the michael bolton from office space exactly uh so what what is this movies right no i think we can keep talking about whatever it is we're talking about right now <laughs> i saw the devil is that right. class of horror movie because i am a horror author and i recommended this one because i believe that sometimes not my books but sometimes horror stories should make you feel bad. <laughs> yeah, this is, I would call yes. this an adult horror film in that. So you both have seen this movie before, right? Yes. I had not. All I knew about this movie was it was called I Saw the Devil. And you were like, let's do it for, you know, for spooky times. So I, I kind of expected the devil to show up um, <laughs> or for this to be supernatural uh, in some way. But no, it's a serial killer movie. Mm-hmm. It is a- actually technically classified as an action thriller or a mystery thriller uh, when you go to, to rent it. Yeah, uh, I would. Which isn't to say it isn't a horror squarely movie. Squarely f- put this in the category of horror because yeah. Yeah. there is a hook here because I've seen a lot of serial killer movies. There is a. The, this is one we'll get into it but you watch it he catches the killer very early and then something unusual happens and yeah. then it becomes a horror movie versus a police procedural you know where it's like because like nobody thinks of law and order or law and order svu or what are the other law and orders let's list them all now law, law mm-hmm. and order uh big easy New Orleans. yeah um I- anyway uh, nobody thinks of those as horror stories. It's like, well, no, it's police procedurals, even though they deal with you know, serial killers and rapists and everything else. It's like, uh, this goes deep into horror territory in the way that scares me. Because if I watch a monster movie, I'm watching like, like if I see a really cool monster, I'm like, that is a great makeup effect. Like, oh, I, th- I bet that's an animatronic. Like, I love it. It's right. like, oh, it's a great monster design. You see, I'm saying, I'm not like thinking, oh my gosh, what if that thing turned up in my house? Right. It's like, no, that's cool as hell. Like, that's a great design. That's, a, oh, I love the way it moves. That's so, so creepy. Where stuff like this is more, like, unsettling to me. Because I previously done an episode here about the horror movie Funny Games, which, again, also does not have a monster in it. But good God. Yeah. Right. The very, yeah. What if that turned up in my house? I was, I was 
thinking about that yeah. with the main what, killer. What if this. old boy turned up in my house? Yeah. yeah, man. So this the the serial killer in this. I I man. I wish I looked up his name uh, because I'm a big fan of old boy. I'm staring at an old boy poster right now. He is the main character in Old Boy, and he is the serial killer in this. And it's funny that his two most prominent films, he is just a fucking mess in both of them. Yeah, he sure uh, is. In two very different ways. But man, he's so good at what he does. He's such a good actor. And he is terrifying in this. Uh, for people who don't know the plot, first of all, I think it's safe to say we all quite enjoy this film or consider it a good film, yeah. right? Yes. yes. And uh, and again, this, this does not mean that we think the things in the movie are good good it is right. effective at watch if you watch this and you thought this is a movie for bad people i would not dispute that it is <laughs> it is extremely effective at making you feel the way it wants you to feel uh, we'll we'll get into yeah. all that but but it's yeah i think it is extremely well made i think it goes places you do not know it's going to go but yeah uh, and, and everything about the way it's staged and the way it conveys the violence is awful. You hate the violence. You're not rooting yeah. for it. It's not slapstick. That's one big thing with slasher movies is so many of the kills on Friday the 13th, that kind of movie is slapstick. It's done for right. comedy. <clears throat> yeah, Jason is a comedic character. For sure. Yes. I, I actually found some of this conceptually funny, I got to say. When I realized what was happening, I was, it, 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 it kind of made me <laughs> on chuckle. A, on a... On a br the broad, on a broad, the, the broad, strokes, the broad yes. stroke of what the the hook is, which is basically, we will get into it in more detail. But basically, the hook is the detective figures out who the murderer is, and instead of arresting him, he just randomly will show up and beat the ever loving shit out of him, and then just leave him alone. And like yeah. every time, the killer's like, "What the fuck is happening? Who is this guy?" It's it's very. It reminded me of how I met your mother with the slap bit, where he's owes him slaps. So and this is not a. It, 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 yeah, he, and so he, he just does, starts randomly he, slapping him. He does in, the He does indeed owe him slaps in this movie. In this movie, yes. <laughs> but I think I think the best comparison we brought up old boy. It really is because it even is the same country, right? It's South Korean. Yes, uh, uh, and, uh, I believe uh, Choi Min Sik is that is that actor's name. Thank you. Um, it's very much the same tone as uh, Old Boy and most of Park Chan Wook's films. I would say it's even a revenge film, which is a big, you know, Park Chan Wook theme. Which isn't to say we need to compare the two, but in terms, if if people haven't watched the movie and want to know what kind of tone it is, it's very much in line with those films. Uh, it's even from the same like two thousands era. This is, I think, two thousand ten, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, so it is about a, yeah, a detective who's, uh, I want to say fiance. His, his fiance, yes. yes. Fiance. Yeah. Is uh, kidnapped and murdered by old boy. Uh, and it's horrific. She tells him she's pregnant. He, he, he murders her and chops her body up. And then they find her body. And you, you think you're about to watch a very long revenge tale where he's trying to find the person who did this. But as we've already pointed out, he fi figures out who does it pretty quickly. And then the rest of the film is him essentially physically and psychologically torturing this man and, and, and sort of um, letting, letting him go and letting him even harm other people. But then the moment he starts to do anything serial killer, like uh, coming in and just giving him a beat down in, in a, a really graphic, horrific beat down, not that we feel bad for this guy. Uh, no, and then it sort he, of turns... When he, starts, when he shows up and starts beating him with a fire extinguisher, I stood up. Yeah. <laughs> I and was that, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's and, incredible. And then makes sure the guy gets medical attention every time. Yeah. So yes. that he can come back. And, and, and to be clear, multiple people do wind up dying because he... He does this like what he's yes. doing is insane. It's not like, oh, yeah, you know, kick his ass. You know, no. The whole point is, is that it knows you're rooting for revenge as the, the viewer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you've got it, it is very I don't know what's the right word to use. The film is very mean, I guess, in the sense that, for example, when it shows this young lady getting brutally killed by this guy, like you see her having this extremely charming phone conversation with her fiance, who is a police detective. 
and they get off the phone and she's just very sweet and young and kind. And then this the killer comes up and pretends like he's there to help her because her car has she's got a flat tire. I guess you, you, the presumption is that he caused that or, or whatever. Um, and that she's like very kind to him, but cautious, you know, like any woman would be. She's alone. And then when he kills her, like the way he does it, like he hits her in the head with a hammer and the, and the hammer like bounces off her head in a way that's like, it's not slapsticky at all. It's like gut wrenching. Yeah. And then the he second t- murder as well. It's brutal. Yeah. And then he takes her back to his killer lair and like dismembers her and you see him do that. And he has like a conversation with her and he's very like this guy plays it. So it, it's a level of detachment. Yeah. That is. I- it's it, it's people act like it's easy to act detached because like oh you're just being wooden but there's a level of like insidious or malicious detachment that is chilling the first murder um of the fiance i wrote down i was like oh is he killing for somebody else because he seems like he doesn't care yeah uh he he's he seems completely like he's, detached he seems, he seems like he's running an errand that he's kind of irritated with right and later the other murders are different uh but it, he does a really good job. I think a lot of the themes of this, um, obviously the one we're talking about here, which is like the cycle of violence and trauma that this police detective essentially becomes a serial killer himself. Right. He has and him causes the harm of other people. Yeah. He has him dead to rights like five different times in the movie where he could easily bring him in. He's not just, he's not just a police detective. He's like in the FBI. He's like a super high ranking right. Uh, uh, law enforcement person and he's got this guy but he keeps letting him go so he can beat him within an inch of his life over and over and over again and because he does that like his father-in-law gets killed his sister-in-law gets killed a bunch of other people get hurt uh, and he kind of doesn't seem to care until the very end and then when he finally gets his revenge and finally kills old boy uh, he finally breaks down and, and has like the reaction that's sort of been building the whole time. It's like, oh, I, you know, it, it's not the realization. It's not only have I lost all of these people that I cared about, but like I contributed to this evil and it has not brought me any kind of peace. In fact, it's brought me the exact opposite. Um, right. Yeah. Because the second theme I would argue that's in this, uh, broadly speaking, is the idea that you can't take revenge or you can't punish something truly evil. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I feel like that's where the title comes from as well. Uh, in that, like, you, uh, old boy, we're just going to call him old boy. Uh, he, he plays it like a complete, unrelenting sociopath. And so what the realization is at the end is, like, you can cause him physical pain, but he's never going to feel remorse and he's never he's never going to truly uh it's not it's not going to be satisfying it's just never going to be that and you could argue all revenge is like that right but it's especially like especially against this guy yeah the way he plays it the, the uh, coupled with the title it's sort of like trying to punish the nature of things it would be like trying to get revenge on cancer where it's right. just it just doesn't you're not going to get any kind of you're not going to get anything that you want from that. Right. All you can do is lock this guy up. Yeah. Which he repeatedly fails, fails to, to do. do. Yeah. Because he's kind of on tilt. Like yeah. he's kind of like, I, I'm going to get this guy. And that's, you know? and the, the other thing is it's uh, the detective uh, is played by Lee Byung Hoon, who plays uh, storm shadow in the GI Joe movies. Uh, it's like of course, on squid game. Wasn't he? Maybe I, I didn't thought he watch played squid the front game. man and squid and squid game. Yeah. Or was he? Wait, was he the cop? I'm gonna, no, I'm he, was the no guy the cop was he was the bad guy. He was the front man in the the weird mask. Uh, oh. I guess everybody had a weird mask, or at least I I think so. I, again, if I have him confused with someone else, I apologize to him but, and his friends. And, anyway, the point is is that old boy is nowhere near a physical match for him, right? Like he easily beats the Christ out of him every time he shows up. So yes. it's like. He so right. easily could put this guy down at any point, but he doesn't. Because uh, he wants to fuel this bizarre right. revenge that he's uh, enacting. <laughs> yeah. And and he is, in fact, Squid Game. Oh, he is? Okay, uh, cool. I looked it up. I still haven't seen uh, it, so sorry. I couldn't contribute to oh, that. Oh, you, you should see the Squid Game. Yeah, I should. Yeah. I should. 
Looping you back like from um, what I was saying about how the it's kind of I said it's like a mean film, like the way the the victim gets found as a group of young children are playing, like in a, a pond or a swamp or something, and they find a severed ear. Yeah, that and kid has changed forever. Just in a lunch yeah, sack. Then, well, and then a tons of of like press and and gonkers show up, just like whole crowd, because of course I'm I'm assuming there they don't have tons of serial killers. Like it's this huge media event. And they find this woman's severed head and like the detective is there and her father, who is a retired detective, is there. Um, and they all watch us in there. They like box up the head and they drop it because people are jostling around trying to get photos. And it's just like everything that happens is like the worst possible yeah. thing. Yeah, and for it's, sure. It's not so much that it's gratuitous. It's just like it's like so unflinching because it's establishing very, very, very early that there's no place we won't go in the course of showing you what's about to happen. Like, like right. it sets yeah. a battery very early that it set the tone. Uh, this is a mean universe. This is a, this is, we're not going to cut away at the moment of impact the way so many movies do to, to keep their film rating. We're going to show it. We're going to show the impact. We're going to show blood spraying and, you can call it gratuitous. I would say it is all bound up within the exact theme of this movie. Because when it says, I saw the devil, we can have a spirited debate about what that is referencing. But I think the the devil that you see is like what comes out of this detective when he sees this at the beginning. Because you see him grieve, you see him cry at the funeral, and then you never see him show any emotion again he immediately goes to a friend and says okay like under the table not like he takes vacation time from being a cop and is like okay who are the suspects and then he sets about robotically like a terminator tracking down who did this and it is yeah scary watching him operate because it's like at this point he feels nothing Mm -hmm. it's funny you mentioned that this is a world that they're not used to serial killers because there's so many serial killers in this movie. Um, right. That was one the, of the, the, the flag. It's very funny. How many serial, yeah. <laughs> it, it's very funny how many serial killers just sort of show up in this. Um, yeah. Well, it's one of the, there's also the cab driver, yeah. which I was like, what are they up to? Oh, they're highwaymen. Basically they've killed, yeah. the, they've killed the cab driver and stuffed him in the trunk. And then they're going to rob old boy and boy, does that not work out for them? No, that really no. doesn't work. And I, I like that they do. That was, that's another aspect of what I was talking about before about how they show that the detective can easily beat this guy. Cause nobody else in this world can like every other situation right. that old boy is in. He is the most terrifying monstrous predator imaginable. He, nobody is any match against him. They have no hope. He just carves his way through so many people like a force of nature. So it's like when the detective shows up and just easily beats the shit out of him, you're like, Oh good. He's right. finally going to get put down, but then Nope. He just keeps letting him go. So it like makes no. that hit all the more hard because you see what a, just a menace old boy is tearing right. his way through people uh in every and other situation to, yeah going back to jason wait like defining it as mean it's it's a very interesting because i know it's, it, it, you're describing like unflinching right like oh the actual movie old boy is the same way and uh where it's that for example one of the things he does to this guy is he cuts through his ankle he cuts his achilles uh, tendon achilles tendon yeah and they just show it happen yeah it's an and extreme it's, it, close up yeah and so i it's it's interesting because i don't actually agree that the term for it would be mean um i'm not Ooh. sure what it's what the uh, term would be i think that it's actually more responsible to show violence this way than a lot of movies do I right have a, i have a couple of thoughts about that be, okay yeah because it's showing the violence in a way where you're like, I don't like this. I don't like it. This is happening to a, a villain and I still don't like watching it. I don't want to see it. Yeah. I don't, I don't, you know, like it's, it's how violence should be kind of interpreted in film, which is as violent, you know, like yeah. disturbing. Yeah. And r related to that, first I wanted to talk about, calling it mean so i agree with jason this movie is mean but i don't think it's i'm i'm defying it defining it the same way uh you are dave i'm thinking of it mean in terms of like 
he gets the detective gets the worst possible punishment for what he's doing like like it's not only the, oh yeah it's mean his, to the detective for yeah sure. it, it's just mean it's every situ every <laughs> everything like uh the kindly father-in-law and his kindly sister-in-law both get horribly murdered his kindly fiance gets horribly murdered like nothing good happens to anyone in this right. movie so that's what i think of when i think of it mean but yeah, like, yeah I, I think i don't know what the best a better word for it is because it, it's not a criticism it's saying that the film is not going to respect your sensibilities whatsoever right. it's right. not going to protect your feelings and this is a mean universe like like uh, that you know the woman could have been discovered in a lot of ways and instead they chose for these children to stumble across so like a right. lot of things could happen and play out in a way that you know when the bad guy far into this process when he's been released and he winds up getting medical care and then he you know he pins a, a nurse in a back room and makes her take her clothes off like he could have gotten, she could have gotten rescued much sooner <laughs> than she did. Mm -hmm. uh, right. it, it, it allows terrible things to happen to undeserving people. But again, in service of exactly what it's doing, because the whole point is at the very beginning, if you think it's a straightforward, like Liam Neeson revenge movie, you're rooting for him. Like when he starts on his path to go find this guy, it's like, we're rooting for this cop to find him and, and, you know, to give this guy what he deserves. It's like it's cool that he's take, he's he's not doing an investigation. He's going on vacation or doing this on his own time, and you're rooting for him to succeed. Um, and then as it goes and as you see what he does, you want it to be over. It, it, it's, it's terrible. It, 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 the way it keeps going, he keeps prolonging it on purpose. It's awful. Like, you yeah. don't want it. It's like, I want this to stop. It's like, no, because there's one point where the cops are going to arrest the guy, the bad guy, and the protagonist snatches him away from the cops. It's like, no, I'm not done. It's right. like, that's insane. You he have sure a moment does. for him. He's going to get convicted. He's left evidence everywhere. The guy's going to go away forever. It's like, He's no. He's covered in blood. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, no, it's like, no, I'm not done. I'm not done doing my revenge. And it's like, at that point, you're not rooting for him. You're not rooting because there's nothing good that's going to happen now. Too much bad has happened. Too many people have suffered. Right. Like, there's no happy ending anymore. Yeah, that ledger's never getting balanced. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the difference between... Oh, sorry, Tom. You were going to say something. Just the, the other thought I had about the violence, where you showed that it, it's, it's unflinching sometimes. Because, like, if you notice, in the actual murder scenes, like, it shows the violence of him knocking his victims out. Like, he hits one woman with a hammer, he hits the next one with a pipe. But the actual murders themselves, it does cut away at the point of impact. You don't actually see him murder the victims but that's it, true it doesn't cut away when the detective is wailing on him and cutting his ankle up and you know like or when he shows up on the first suspect and just obliterates the guy's balls with um uh, i forget what he hits him oh with. yeah a wrench a wrench what? yeah like it doesn't it doesn't flinch from the violence that we're supposed to be rooting for but it makes it really awful on and i and i think it's interesting that it it does that because i think it yeah. ser it serves what you were talking about before um well yeah to, so to me it's the difference between torture porn like mm -hmm. american torture porn uh oh um you know i guess hostile there's other examples uh, uh human centipede where it, it feels like those are made specifically for shock, right? Mm -hmm. They're made because they want to horrify us and make audiences kind of laugh and giggle too and be and flinch. Where this is actually a statement about violence. And I would argue the entire this entire weirdly niche genre of South Korean revenge thrillers all kind of do that. Mm -hmm. Uh which is it's to show like the reason I think they do stuff where it's like, well, of course it's going to be a kid who finds the body. Of course, uh, his elderly future father in law and like the family is going to get victimized and there's, we're not going to get the Hollywood ending where it all works out is because it's, yeah, it's trying to make that statement. I would say the sexual violence in this, which they do, they do follow some restraint with, mm -hmm. uh, is there because they're showing like he let this guy go and look what he's doing to people you know like that is yeah that's very much the point mm -hmm. is to not look away and to show this stuff in a in a way that's gut-wrenching 
because that is yeah the, the point about the violence and the cycle of violence and what violence does and and revenge and it doesn't it's not trying to say like this guy getting revenge he's no different than the serial killer or like it's worse but they're just trying to point out that yeah there's no in seeking revenge there really is no like satisfying ending it's just more sadness on top of it uh so i think that's what makes this different because i i don't like i don't like a lot of those gory like the torture horror films but this stuff appeals to me and i think that's the distinction which is that this feels a lot more like it's trying to give uh an unflinching look at violence and yeah it is ultimately the plot is very mean because it's trying to say this violence is mean you know it it results in tragedy uh, and, and I very much like that about this. There's a technical issue I want to bring up. It's, it's noted on the Wikipedia page that the Korean, the media rating board forced them to cut the film before they'd release it. And they had to cut, I guess, a minute and a half of, you know, how these things go. They're like, there's a specific right. shot. Yeah. Do we know, I can't immediately find out. Do we know if the version that, I watched the version on Amazon Prime. Do we know if that's the cut or uncut version? Uh, I wa- the one I watched on Prime specifically said like uncut or like unrated on it, so I assume that's the full version. Interesting, but I'm not positive because you mentioned I, the way it edits, like the the killing blows and the women things like that. And I'm now curious if that wasn't the rating board saying no, it's okay to show you mutilate mutilating old boy, but you no, you cannot you cannot show him like chopping the head off of this this young woman like that's like that's too far. But I, well, that'd, I don't, be, that'd be interesting because it seems so purposeful at least the way that i interpret it but that, that yeah. would be that would be funny if i'm sitting here talking about oh here's the intent behind this and the intent was actually just to get like a better rating and <laughs> it turns out the version that i watched was the censored version i'm not sure i want to see the uncut version <laughs> right i'm actually probably fine with with never seeking that out because what i saw was that was enough for me this is yeah this yeah, is pretty bold plenty. it's pretty bold <laughs> it's violence <laughs> Oh um, man, we. I guess the final. I guess not button, but like the 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 end of the detective's revenge, uh, is like such the I guess like a perfect way to end the film, and it's it's also it it has a great deal to do with when this movie's over, you just feel bad, <laughs> which is. Right. He, he, as we mentioned, he, uh, old boy's about to be arrested, but he grabs him instead. And he's like, no, I'm not done yet. And he kidnaps him away, drags him back to uh, his, his murder palace, old boy's murder palace, where he sets him up in this machine in his own guillotine that he's been using, uh, on his victims, uh, and has the, puts the rope in old boy's mouth. Uh, he basically has to hold it. And as soon as his jaw gets too tired, he's going to have to let it go. And he's going to cut his own head off. But what old boy doesn't realize until the detective is leaving is that we see earlier in the film that when he's trying to track old boy down, he goes and talks to old boy's parents who are these is this sweet elderly couple, you know, living out in the country somewhere. And also he has a, a young son that stays with his parents and this, you know, he's just a little boy. He's just, you know, he's, he's not bad or anything. He's just a, a little mm-hmm. kid, doesn't know anything. Um, so the detective arranges for his parents and his son to show up at the murder lair uh, to see him suspended in this horrible situation. And he has the door rigged. So as soon as th- his parents and son walk in, it chops his head off in front of them. And that's right. That's the end of his revenge. It- yeah, it pulls the rope from his mouth because he's holding yeah. the rope. And then, and so, like, yeah, it makes it so that his parents and son have to feel responsible yep. for killing him. Yep. And again, we talked about the little boy finding the ear. It's it's no different. Mm-hmm. He's he's like, I, I'm going to ruin your family. Along, And it's the closest he gets to affecting the guy. Because what we don't mention is before that, we have the scene where he just talks to him. And he more or less says, like, there's nothing you can do. Like, you have me tied up here. You're going to chop off my head. I don't care. Like, there's yeah. no there's no bottom here. You know, there's no there's there's no moment that's going to make me repent. Uh, like, he begs for his life at first. Uh, and then he goes back on it, basically. 
uh, and you don't really know. Like he's he's very you know he's very manic, I and think... you don't really know what's going through his head in any given moment. Yeah, uh, they do a lot of things with him and the other and the cannibals where they arbitrarily blame the victims for their own demise, okay. being like. Why did you say that to me? Why did you do that? That's why I'm killing you. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's like they, they justify it one minute and they don't the other. So he's basically, he's the Joker, you know? He's the Joker, baby. <laughs> the Joker, he, baby. He, yeah, he, he has, there's nothing, there's nothing consistent to him that you can hold down and punish. You just, and, for uh, people who have not seen the movie, they heard you mention the cannibals in passing in yeah, the middle yes. of your sentence yeah. we have not previously discussed there's a subplot or i guess a kind of a detour in the middle of the movie where it turns out there's an organization of cannibals yeah <laughs> incidental cannibals not, so that's that's i wanted to say this and this is a good segue to that is people listening to us who haven't seen it first of all you should have you should go see it but if you can't stomach a film like this you might you might mistakenly feel like this isn't a fun movie or this movie isn't enjoyable to watch. Like when we said, for example, that the cops almost had him and then he steals him away. He does that by speeding his van. Uh, he breaking the door off of his car and then speeding it in and grabbing him from the door in this really uh, bitchin way. So this movie is it's horrific. It doesn't glorify violence, but it also is like, yeah, let's we can have a little fun with this. And I would argue the cannibal sequence is that is is them being like, eh, let's stop for a moment and have fun with these fucking cannibals out of nowhere. Yep. The violence in this movie is exquisitely staged. The yeah. fight scenes are amazingly staged. They're wonderfully like the the brutality, but also just the way it's it's shot, the way it's it's choreographed. Yeah, when he when all... he stabs the two guys in the taxi is the, that is that scene. Oh my god! One of the most horrible things I've ever seen. But also, like, only the third most horrible thing in this movie. Right. <laughs> and it's like, it and is wonderfully horrific. staged. It's, it's, it's amazing. staged so, yeah, incredibly. It's it's just this, the camera is spinning around them in the car, and sort of like the car spinning out of control, and it just keeps getting faster, and, and, and the, as it's getting faster, the violence in the car is getting more extreme. It's really remarkable. It's the, a three-way uh, yeah. knife fight. Yes. Yeah. In which, like, arteries keep getting severed inside this it, this frenzied. It, it's it's something. It's uh, and again, though, those are that's not even the main storyline. That's that's two guys who he picked him up on the way back from his encounter with the detective. One of the times he let him go, um, but yeah, right. It's it, this is the the comical parts where it's like. Yes, he's a horrific serial killer. He's also having like a bad time, regardless of that. It is like kind of, how bewildered he <laughs> is by this is really yeah. funny. <laughs> he's just it's like, just Jesus, like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, like it's again, he keeps running into every serial killer. In the case of the cannibals, they are like his cannibal friends. They're his friends. So yeah. I, I guess serial killers all just like hang out, like they're colleagues. Yeah, they have a, uh, they, have, they have a slack. They have a, a, a friend slack. Yeah. A yeah, group, sure. a group that chat. Hints at a history. So was it was not clear to me. Was the the deal that he was killing these women and then delivering their body parts to this cannibal family? I was think at least were, I, I think at least some of it because they only ever find the fiance's head and ear. Um, I think it was because I, I get like a Silence of the Lambs vibe a little bit off this movie. So I was sort of equating it in my head to like Hannibal, where they they'll, they're like feeding people to the pigs kind of and it's like right. one way of disposing of his body so that's kind of how i interpreted it is that he sometimes brings them you know cuts. that makes sense yeah cuts of meat as it were yeah and it's this it's this cannibal and like his girlfriend mm -hmm. who you can't like i i want to know her deal more because she doesn't seem interested in the cannibalism it's like her it's like the hobby of like her boyfriend or husband old boy's like not either like he's eating like chicken yeah 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 no like one's the, into the cannibalism cannibal, but cannibal's him. cannibal's giving him shit he's like you gotta try this as soon as you try it you're not gonna weed anything else and old boy's like yeah i'm good yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's real it's real weird and like yeah they definitely kill people themselves because he has someone there yeah. who he's gonna kill who looks apparently i believe is the previous owner of the house they're in very nice house uh and like uh, in the sequence basically we're introduced to the cannibals uh what they're doing the people that they have 
And then our detective comes in and basically whoops the shit out of all of them, uh, including old boy who suffers like his fifth concussion. Uh, <laughs> he beats his ass like he's so really, bad in this movie. <laughs> he's really not doing good. <clears throat> There's a lot of people getting beaten in the head with hammers, blood spurting from their head, and then the next scene of them waking up, and I'm just like, I disagree. Yeah, I don't Hard know about that. I disagree there. Yeah. yeah. But it's, you know, in it's, the in the it's a, world that they presented, apparently, that's just how it is. It's and a film, for, isn't it? For example, the, yeah. and you're never rooting for that. For example, the cannibal that he bashes him over the head many, many times till blood sprays out of a skull. Like, he wakes up later in the hospital, and because the detective at this point has um, lost track of old boy because he has figured out that the detective was following him thanks to a, a tracker he had forced down his throat. Yeah, and so right. he gives himself diarrhea, yeah. and then you see him fish the tracker out of the diarrhea in the toilet. Which was yet another hard-to-watch scene for yeah, but different again, reasons. Uh, yeah, yeah, but again, uh, unflinching and showed you the whole process. Yeah. Um, and then the detective goes to the hospital to find the cannibal to say, hey, where's our where's our friend? And he d- the cannibal straight up tells him, oh, he's going to go after your, your family. Correctly tells him that. And then uh, someone describe for the audience what the detective does in response to this. In short, he jokers him. Uh, he, uh, so the guy starts laughing and he's like, oh, you think that's funny? And it basically, let's put a smile on that face. He grabs his jaw and he pulls and, and starts tearing the person's, uh, the cannibal's jaw off, which is very symbolic considering he's a, he's a cannibal as well. Mm-hmm. And again, no sympathy for the cannibal. Still don't want to see it. <laughs> Still watching it like, oh, please stop for the love of God. Yeah, you should stop. Stop, man. stop hurting that cannibal. <laughs> you should probably stop uh, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He he. Uh, he King Kong's him. Yeah. He wishmasters him. There if it you is. Recall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the the film mirrors. Uh, he mirrors him. He mirrors him. Yeah. Tears that fucker's jaw off, and we don't see it complete, but we see enough. To not want to see it. Uh, yeah, it makes uh, it extremely clear. That's the thing, is it lingers on the shot for longer than you want it to. Mm-hmm. And this movie yeah. does that a lot. It's like, no, no, <laughs> you're going to watch this. Yeah, it's like, no, no, uh, no, yeah, no. We're going to make you watch you it. You wanted yeah. to see the devil, so. Right? Yeah, and here it is. The devil is this cycle of violence. That is how I interpret it. The devil that has been unleashed is not any person in this movie. Mm-hmm. It is just this energy it is this force that makes people do things it's 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 uh, evil and as yeah. as as represented by the cycle of violence i th- i think um yeah yeah and i think that's yeah i think there's a really interesting i know that there have been a billion movies made about well was the violence wrong and there's so many movies where you know, the good guy finally confronts the bad guy. But it's like, no, it's up to the jury to decide, uh, you know, and it's like, you know, no, if I if I kill this guy, then I'm no better than he is or whatever. This is very common thing in American cinema. I thought this was a especially American phenomenon because of our attitude toward like our old West attitude toward justice. And mm-hmm. so I was interested to find out. I, I love Korean cinema as much as, the, like, this is one blessing of the streaming era is exposing me to Korean horror movies and action movies and dramas that I was a little surprised to find that, yeah, this is a popular long-running genre over there and that they do apparently revenge movies uh, as well as anyone. For sure. Well, I would say better. Like, so... Uh, yeah. My first experience with Korean, like, uh, drama and revenge was... 2003 when i went and saw old boy it had been, it was playing at a local indie theater and it blew me away because i had just never seen revenge done that way uh, and i don't want to spoil old boy but old boy again a lot of similar themes where like the violence is unflinching you see him do things to people that you feel like deserve it but then you can't stand to watch it uh and it takes a, a drastic and weird turn and it doesn't feel satisfying in the end. It's not like, oh, he got his revenge. And I had just never seen anything like that where <clears throat> a revenge movie didn't end in the way you wanted it to. Right. It didn't Hollywood it. Even like America has 
tried, you know, and obviously uh, they there's a famous American remake of Old Boy, but uh, they have tried yeah. to make revenge movies about where like revenge is a trap, um, but it's not as um, eloquently stated, I think, as as this yeah. film and Old Boy, where it it is it's a trap, and they they the hero right. the protagonist walks right into it willingly, uh, and in not so much an old boy, but definitely in this movie, he's fully aware of what the cost is. Like, he knows mm-hmm. he, that he's continuing to let this guy go, and he's harming people when he lets him go. But he doesn't care. Right. We just, we don't have it in our system in in America, which isn't to say that American films don't do other things very well. Yeah. Uh, it's just that the way we handle violence in general is kind of messed up. Again, I, I'm... It's, it's Alan I, Alda I, pulling I, out a gun at the end of Murder at 1600. Yeah. <laughs> and I love Murder at 1600 as much as everybody in America does. Yeah. We, we constantly celebrate that film. And, and that's a beloved film with the, with the young and old alike. But what I, I guess what I'm saying is that it's, I, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that I think from an outside perspective or a historical perspective, the way we treat violence does feel wrong. Because we glorify it, and we glorify it while also while also sanitizing it. it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, and I think that's what makes it so that this genre and this country doing these seem to have that edge that we don't, because they don't do any of that. They don't sanitize it. They don't glorify it, and yet they can still do a scene where a guy kicks the ass of a bunch of people in a hallway and be awesome. Like they can balance all that out in this really compelling way that is very unique. Uh, and I, you know, I don't know. I wish, I wish we would figure that out here, but I, like you said, Jason, I'm just glad to have access to it. You know, I think the most irresponsible handling of violence is PG 13 violence, yep. like Marvel movie violence. Yeah. Right? You've got a gun battle like in uh, winter soldier or something like that. And everybody's shooting at each other with assault rifles and many, many people get get gunned down, and so the gun hits them. You maybe see a CGI blood splatter, but before PG-13, generally that you just grab your chest and fall down and you're dead. You go to sleep. Right. Whereas I, anyone who has ever, if you've ever gotten curious when you were a teen on the internet, they didn't have the internet when I was a teen, but I know that some of the listeners do. But if you were a teen on the internet and you got curious about looking up like real crime scene photos or real like like occasionally photos will leak after a mass shooting you'll see what the victims actually looked like when they were hit with an ar-15 um and what that what those bullets actually do to the body and what that actually Uh, yeah i had i was gonna bring that up yeah i had that experience you know because i grew up i grew up watching you know american action movies and people getting shot and just falling over when the first time i read about like what bullets actually do to the human body and then saw pictures of it i was like no fucking way yeah like it, it's the, like so oh yeah yeah it's like so sanitized in america in american cinema and in a lot of movies but in american the cinema specifically where you'll get shot in the shoulder which is you know the the non-lethal place to get shot in a movie and then just keep fighting and it's like if you've seen the inside of a shoulder like an x-ray all those little bones in there all those joints all those tendons and a bullet hits you and goes bouncing around in there that's an, that's a wound you'll feel for the rest of your life like, right. you'll never be normal after that. You'll never have full range of motion after that. But we're so trained to, it's like, oh, he, they just got him in the arm. It's like the token the token little arm injury or, or whatever. He got shot in the leg. Well, he only got shot in the leg. It's like, yeah, you get shot in the leg. There's a real good chance you're never going to walk normally again after that. Right. You, Everything sh- would stop, you know? Yeah, it like, shatters that bone. You have a, a pretty big artery running down there. If you nick that, you're going to be dead within under 60 seconds. Right. Um, so I feel like that's, and I know this is an old debate because people used yeah. to talk about like the old Westerns they would show in the 1950s on TV and it's just John Wayne shooting the Indians and, uh, you know, they shoot the bad guy, they, they grab their chest and fall off the horse where if you try to show the re- realistically, it'd be censored. So it's like you censor the real thing, you censor what it actually looks like, but you allow the sanitized version how does that make sense? He killed a man. Either way, why is it's it that right. showing it's... what it actually looks like to kill a man? Why is that banned? Like you see, you know, like something like the Kennedy assass- assassination. Like even on a fuzzy, grainy piece of film, you see what that rifle bullet did to his head. Like, yeah, that's what it looks like when a high powered, right. you know, high velocity shocking. rifle yeah. round. Yeah, um, and and it's yeah, it's not even just like glorification doesn't even really feel like a strong enough word. It's like it's romanticizing it. 
is what yeah. it does. And I would, I, I mean, you mentioned it. It's most people are aware of this. I feel yeah. like I don't think we have. I don't think you need to. People need to feel bad when they watch Commando or another film or you know, like any action film that glorifies. I, it. I feel incredible every time I watch Commando, yeah. Dave. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people are aware of it, but I do think you don't. You aren't truly aware of it until you watch a movie like this. Sometimes, like it's a, it's a, it's a stark reminder of it. Where it's like it's easy to sort of get like get used to it and there's, forget. There's a, a more recent development, and I guess it's not so recent, but there's there's a I guess a recent iteration of it that I think I, I thought of while watching the movie this time. Uh, this is actually the third time I've seen this film. Um, this time watching it, I was I I kept thinking about the sort of like I said, they cut away from the actual murders, but you do spend a lot of time with old boys victims really stewing in the extreme like terror that they're feeling. And I was, I started thinking about like the wave of really gross true crime documentaries that have been hitting like Netflix and every other place and like gross true crime podcasts and things like that, where it's like really, really too, like obviously everybody's interested in true crime. uh, But like, glossing over um the victimization aspect of it and i think this movie does for violence uh, does what it does for violence the same thing that it does for uh sort of reminding you of the victims in like true crime when you're like for sure yeah like i kept thinking about that when i was watching it this time i don't know if i articulated that very well but that was on my mind no i i know what you're saying what true crime is the kind of thing like i'm actually surprised we haven't gotten a movie yet about a true crime podcaster who becomes a victim and it's and it's sort of like pointing this out which is true crime is generally getting exploitative not all of it Mm -hmm. but you know a lot of it and there's so many dime a dozen things of like a couple of comedians talking about someone's fucking death and it really with this like glib like, humor yeah like uh, it's and like, almost uh, but gleefully, sometimes they'll go like yeah, yeah sometimes they'll be like oh my god that's horrible and then they'll make a joke and it's like such a trivialized version and and so like and i yeah i don't know if that's new you know, I've been watching old episodes of Unsolved Mysteries, oh, and no, it's and like, oh, yeah, wow. You know, uh, uh, Sherman Capote got accused of that for, in cold, you know, it's it's not exactly. new. It's I'm not just new. like, there's like, it's iterative, uh, and we're in a current uh, resurgence yeah. of it because of like podcasts and like streaming documentaries are very cheap to produce, so they're starting to pop up. They're, they're cheap to produce and they're extremely popular, so they're popping up on all the streaming services right now. Right, and, and again, this movie, I mean, because this movie is about violence and cycle of violence and victims, it naturally also includes that. Like, I see why you would think about that. Like, I don't think the filmmakers were thinking about it, but it, they, it's such a wide net that they're casting. Yeah, maybe not specifically, but certainly, because it's in the same neighborhood, right, of, of, of showing you For sure. the reality of violence. Or it's like, this is right. how it, and yeah. It should be noted, I, I, know, I, I already said, someone gets hit on the head several times and survive. It's not completely realistic. No. It's what it's what they do that matters is the the performances, the way the people act, uh, the way the people are clearly in pain, are being tortured, are suffering. It it's it's like yeah, it might not be medically accurate completely, but it invokes uh, a more empathetic response when you're watching. Exactly. It. Exactly. Yeah. So I, the question this movie raises, it, I posted a poll on Twitter one time asking a question. And you listeners, feel free to discuss this among yourselves. Feel free to pause the podcast and discuss with your classmates and friends. Let's say there was a real person who committed a horrific crime just like uh, old boy in in this film. A, A rapist murder, whatever terrible crime you wish to imagine. Let us say we live in a world in which they invent a drug that they can give you that with 100% certainty, it eliminates all urge to rape and murder in the future. It is an instant reform pill. You don't question how it works. You know exactly what I'm about to say in this thought experiment. Right. If they catch the bad guy and they give him this drug, he's cured. Like, like there's no doubt. We 100% know he is cured. He will never rape and murder again. Would you support immediately letting him out? Or, or 
do you feel like you owe it to the families and the victims and whatever societies to make him suffer? Th like, does his, does inflicting suffering on this person do anything if the goal is not reform? Because again, we've got a way to magically reform him. Do you feel like there's some, because I think most people said in my poll, no, he still has to pay. Like implying that there's a ledger, a, a cosmic ledger that has to be balanced it, that I don't mm -hmm. know if it's right. rooted in religious belief or it's just an instinctive, because it's not necessarily about deterrence, but, it, yeah. it, it, but it's about like, does, is this individual still owed to have bad things happen to him? Because there's a line in this movie where it, that specifically is said that he is letting him go because he's going to make him, he's not felt the pain that his dead fiance felt it's like no you still have more pain coming to you and this movie is trying to say well that's what he's doing is madness that mm -hmm. it's also the logic behind a lot of our morality right the idea that regardless of reform regardless of what happens that a certain amount of harm is owed to make things right again yeah I, uh... and not necessarily physical harm but yeah like punishment is certainly an aspect of prison the i mean i mean yeah it's it's, yeah, it's the, the broader yeah. the broader question is what is the purpose of our prison system what what should be the purpose right mm -hmm. um i've done both i've i've had a personal experience that i don't really want to share that uh that made me ask this question and i've you know just for some more news did research and edited something talking about this as well and tom i know i'm yeah. sure you've been thinking about it jason as well uh, it, it, it's that idea of like, isn't our prison system or our justice system, the ultimate goal is public safety, right? That's what it should be. Uh, and, and so for that reason, the answer should be you release the person with the pill because there's also a lot of evidence that uh, <clears throat> families of victims where the 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 criminal was on death row uh ultimately and i'm obviously can't speak for everybody here but there's a like a lot of instances like statistically it didn't help in the end because when someone is on death row they constantly are appealing that verdict and the families have to be constantly brought back to court uh and they can't let go they it, it drags on sometimes for a decade uh, and there's no resolution. And then ultimately, when this person is executed, a lot of the family members were like, and I feel nothing. Like, that's how it kind of, like, this, the, the need for revenge built into our prison system is a really tough situation. Because I think ultimately it is useless. But everybody thinks in that situation they would want revenge because you can't help it. Right. Personally, if you are victimized, you want to see punishment. That's just in our instinct. So it, but like, exactly. Yeah. But if logically, it happened to somebody else, I would say, Oh no, let them go. If it happened to exactly. me and my family, I would say, Oh no. Oh, you can let them go. I'll find them. <laughs> you, it's uh, that right. doesn't mean we're done. Like you can let it go, but no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to watch this guy out shopping at the mall while my whatever my daughter my my wife my my mother whoever is in the grave and like they're never coming back and this guy's out shopping at you know buying new shoes at, at Foot Locker I was like no no it, like so, but what I'm thinking is I can't there's no logic there's no logic unless you you assume as like it's axiomatic that pain is owed for the pain you inflicted but there's no and, and again some people are saying well yeah it's about deterrence. The argument this movie makes, and I do believe this movie is making an argument in its dialogue, is that deterrence would not affect a guy like this. Mm -hmm. the, the type of person who would rape and murder a right. young child, that, like deterrence deters normal people. Like I'm scared to death of getting a parking ticket or getting having a police officer yell at me. But the type of person who is so broken inside and has been so, like, whatever his deranged thought processes are. And, like, in this movie, this guy is almost like an incel type. Like, his whole thing is, like, like women like you have treated me like crap my, my whole life. Like, he thinks he's getting revenge. That's, that's the irony. Right. And, and, but it, it very much makes point. Even after he's had 
the tremendous suffering inflicted on him by this detective, he just immediately goes back to crime the moment he's he's away from it. Second, him. he's free. Like he's, yeah. Yeah, the moment he doesn't like leave the country, it's like, oh, I'm going to go to Japan, start a new life, get away from the psychopath or anything like that. It's like, no, okay, well, I can go right back to kidnapping women again. All right, here I go. And the point right. it's making is that you could kill this guy right in front of the cannibal. The cannibal's still going to be eating people, like like the type of people you're dealing with. So you can't make the argument that it's about deterrence or sending a message to the next bad guy so that maybe you'll get fewer murders. Right, their because there, is, there wouldn't be any more murderers at this point. Like we've had, we've been jailing murderers as, as a species for, I don't know, thousands of years. And right. there's been plenty of study done on the type of, of like antisocial personality types who commit crimes. They can't, they can't imagine themselves getting caught. Like they just can't visualize the future that way. They just don't, it's a combination of like of narcissism or whatever you want to call it. They just can't grasp the, the a, a possible future where they get, where they get caught. Um, because even the ones who don't make any effort to get away with it are, are surprised when they get arrested, even though they, they like had the murder weapon under their bed. It doesn't, they just don't, there's something broken about their about their brains in in the most cases. Again, I'm not talking about the jealous husband who, in a fit of rage, shoots his wife's lover, you know, and then regrets it later. I'm talking about guys like are described in in this movie. So, the question of if you could heal what's broken in them, it, it kind of this detective has clearly decided. Okay, no, I this person is owed pain at all costs. Like even if it results in other people suffering. I, I owe it to my dead wife to inflict harm on this guy that if she were alive, she would never have wanted that. Right. And yeah, I mean, going back to your question, while there isn't a magical pill, there are countries that have reform systems that are far more, you know, uh, forgiving than our system and far more effective, but they don't punish them as, as much. So, like, you know, there is a version uh, that we could be doing uh, of of the the equivalent of the the pill, which is, of course, like, yeah, some people maybe ultimately can't be reformed, but that doesn't mean they should be executed or tortured. That just means they need to be kept from people that they can harm, right? Which is, of course, yeah, what the cops are trying to do to this guy in this. And then he just keeps letting him go. Uh, it's man, <laughs> what a film! Yeah, oh, let me let me take this to an even darker place. Sure, oh, please do. In the spirit of this of this movie, if you watch any comedy from the eighties or nineties, or probably up till five minutes ago, uh, there's a joke. Uh, in Fletch, there's a joke in cartoons from the era, or there's jokes in Family Guy about prison rape. Yep. And or like when, mall rats. When, uh, yeah, when Jared from Subway went to jail, every single comment on every single news article all said the same thing. Every single Twitter thread, every single Facebook thread, they all made the exact same joke, which is now you're going to get what you deserve because you are a rapist and now you will be raped. And this was an unquestioned thing in my life. Like, I do not doubt I have made that joke many times about some sort of, like, you know, don't bend over in the shower when you're in there, blah, blah, blah. Um, because we think it was hilarious. But the the assumption behind the joke that makes it okay to laugh at is that these guys deserve it. After all, they it's... wouldn't be in jail if they didn't deserve to be raped. As if the sexual assault is part of the sentence. Right. And it's not it wasn't it's not always a joke either. Like um, they'll throw it out in dramas and stuff like, oh, you're going to get sent to prison and this is, and then you're going to get raped in prison because it's what you deserve. And it's like a fist pumping moment for the audience. They're like, yeah, it's like this. It's like justice. Uh, like uh, they, right. do, they do a lot in the X-Files. <laughs> they sure do. And uh, even if, so even if... I did again, not remember like, that about the X-Files. Oh yeah, Mulder makes Mulder, so many prison Mulder rape jokes. It's it so weird. More than once. Yeah. What's interesting. interesting about this is like, even if people listening are like, I don't give a shit what happens to them, right? Um, again, from a personal perspective, I've just personally been in that position where I wished someone harm who had done something horrible and then something bad happened to them and realizing that it didn't make it good 
you know, like I'm sure everybody's different, but what I was going, what I'm, what I'm getting at is like anybody who's like, you know, uh, yeah, Jared deserves it or whatever like that. It should be also noted that in prison, uh, sex offenders get murdered often. And again, you could say like, well, fuck them. But the reason that someone like say Brock Turner didn't go to jail is because many judges give lighter sentences to more to usually young boys who have the same skin color as them because the judges know that. So because we let that happen, it actually means less justice for sexual offenders. Um, someone like Brock Turner got off and didn't go to, didn't face punishment because there's an actual problem in our prison system where someone like him would get brutalized. Uh, and again, it, uh, whether or not you care what happens to him, it actually is what helped prevent a lot of punishment for sexual offenders and rapists. So like, that's the thing is that this system, this idea of justice or, you know, you get what you're deserved is breaking the system in ways that are affecting victims of these people. Yeah. And that's really key, I think. And that's what this, this movie yeah, points out, which is interesting. That yeah, that his, it ties his, directly to that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the family members, because he comes for his family members and guess what? They don't get saved. He, he, he hurts them. And that is, that is often what happens, you know, like the system built around, we're going to punish you and we're going to ignore the screams from your cells, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, is is can like it compounds and it affects victims it affects everybody it also like affects crime because like there are there are certain reform systems that don't cause people to reoffend which is in our prison system you know like the way we treat prisoners and like you, like the the how completely helpless they are when they get out of prison just causes them to do more crime and guess what that does that creates more victims so it's not a good system, even if you don't care what happens to these people. And, 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 that's, and that's what it is. It's, it's the emotional need for revenge versus what actually logically makes the world a better place. Uh, and again, I'm not even sure that we can control it. You know, like I don't blame anyone who wishes harm on someone who victimized them because I think that is a natural feeling. Uh, hey. And I'm not even necessarily condemning like the revision, the revenge genre of film where it is like a cathartic, you know, the bad guys get what they have right. coming, um, you know, Django Unchained, like it, that's, you know, I, yeah. I'm not sitting there watching that saying, well, this is shameful the way he treated those people. It's not We that. love to see it. We love to see it. Like, I, I love watching those fucking racist honkies get murdered like yeah but it's really nice to see an exploration of that feeling right mm -hmm. um because i think our attitude toward justice is weird in this country it, it's I, I don't like, I grew up again in the 80s when every 80s cop movie, Dirty Harry or Cobra or any of those the theme is like man it sucks that, that we have to let some stupid tr jury decide what happens to these guys. You know, there's a point in the movie Cobra, that's the Sylvester Stallone crime classic you should go watch, or um, where they're like, this, this, you know, the accused has rights, and he, like, points to the dead woman. It's like, well, what about her rights? I was like, well, <laughs> well yeah, they, they, everyone has rights. It's right because you have to make sure that this is the guy that did it. Like, that's the whole thing. Um and this was a big thing because crime had been rampant in the 70s and was growing or out of control by the mid-80s to the crack epidemic. And this was like Hollywood, white America Hollywood at the time was very conservative. People forget Hollywood was not always seen as like this bastion of progressive ideals. Not that it is today, but people think of it that way. And yeah. people don't realize a lot of these, like, like these Clint Eastwood movies, these cop movies, these rogue cop movies, it was all about it's good to be a rogue cop. Like, wouldn't it be great if we would finally take the restraints off our cops and let them just go out there and yeah. shoot the bad guys? Because <laughs> after all, we all know who the bad guys are. It's not like they would ever accidentally shoot the wrong guy. Um, right. Yeah, every every action movie from the 70s and 80s, it seems like, about cops anyway, is, is all about how due process is bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. 
And at one point in, uh, for instance, Death Wish 3, uh, Charles Bronson's character <laughs> just pulls out a machine gun and starts shooting everybody in that neighborhood. He just shoots everybody. The entire city. Like, I was like, yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't live in this neighborhood if you hadn't done something wrong. Like, it, you know. it escalates into him shooting a man directly in the chest with a bazooka. Yeah, with a bazooka. <laughs> um, Great film. So, so I, I do... We have a weird attitude toward it. Because once you start talking about vigilante violence, and I know that we, we like with Batman, the whole thing about, like, well, Batman doesn't kill. But then, obviously, in many of these scenes, he's clearly yes, he seen, like, like permanently, <laughs> permanently handicapping people. I was like, well, this guy person never walk again. Then the, the question becomes, and I feel like everyone should have this thought at some point in their life, which is, okay, what crime deserves a brutal beating and permanent loss of your ability to walk for what crime is that too much for how much, how much money do you have to have stolen before you lose the ability to walk permanently versus losing the ability to walk for say six months. You see what I mean? Because in the justice system, we do have those numbers down in the justice system. It's imperfect, but we do say this crime gets this punishment. This is the process you can, you're eligible for parole. If you do X, Y, and Z, when you talk about vigilante justice and you have a posse or a vengeance driven cop, it's like, you know, the first thing that we mentioned this guy does when he trying to, before he finds which guy was the killer, he just grabs like the four most likely suspects and starts battering them. And the first one he, he grabs, the guy's like in his underwear and he starts smashing him in the dick with a, a pie branch. And it's hinted that this guy was a criminal and obviously hinted that he had it coming, but it's like, okay, so what, what exact crimes get you like how many blows to the penis do you get for raping a woman or for whatever he did exposing himself or if he murdered a woman does you do you get infinite blows to the penis like you're watching it and you're you're happy to see it and it's like oh this guy probably deserved to get get wanged in the balls with a pipe wrench but it's like okay but how exactly how many times it, like, if this movie were four hours long, it was just watching this guy wing this guy in the balls with a pipe wrench for four straight hours. At what point would you say, you know what, that's probably enough. <laughs> Cancel the Academy it, it, Awards. There's no, there's <laughs> no <laughs> right, reason. The Academy Awards, when we're, when we're having the discussions of this film in the wake of it winning 12 Oscars in every category. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the film is still called I Saw the Devil for no reason. Yeah. It's like... If you were, so like so wait was the wrench the, the devil? wrench the what? devil <laughs> um but the point being like you never quantify in your mind at what point does this guy deserve it because with vig vigilante justice it, it's not it's just whatever i i hit this guy with whatever i had on hand do you see what i mean and I think this movie kind of gets into that a little because it's like like there's multiple times where we see our hero set up a saw style trap because it wasn't just one at the end. He also kind of did it with the cannibal where he like nailed his hands to the table and then like yeah. tied him down. And it's like, OK, that guy probably deserved to have a, a saw style mutilation trap set up for him. But it, it, the thing this is the thing about all of the jokes about the sexual assault in prison, I would love to set these guys down, the comedy writers, everyone who made that joke, the, the tens of thousands of people who made that joke, including me, and say, okay, well, which crimes do you think deserve that? So, like, say drug trafficking. Say you didn't sell the drugs. Say you smuggled them over across the border. Tons of drugs, huge quantities of cocaine, and got a lot of people addicted, probably. So how many sexual assaults does that person des deserve? Or are you just saying that it's the rapist who deserves? And if so, how many times do they deserve to be? Because if you are going to say that that is a natural and good part of the punishment, like you're rooting for it, you, you, like you think it's good that this happens in prison, you don't see this as additional crimes being committed, which, by the way, it is just as illegal to sexually assault someone in prison as it is out in the world. That's really so – that's – I just want to stress that. People don't think of prison as society. It is – also society that's a that's our population those are citizens and so yeah crimes that happen in prison those are crimes those anyway. are crimes and the crimes that you allowed to happen because that person was in your custody and that person was in your care you are responsible for everything that happens to them if yeah. they have a heart attack and they die because you didn't get to them quickly enough to sit there and say well that's what it gets for you know committing a crime stealing all those cars it's like okay so are you saying 
for example, in prison, you, you get half-assed medical care in general. Like it, like with, they won't do any kind of dental work that's cosmetic. If you have like a rotting tooth, they'll either pull it or you leave it in. Like, like they do very rudimentary, and there are all sorts of people with chronic pain, all sorts of things. It is very difficult to get medication. As you can imagine, it is difficult to get medication in prison or get medical care in prison. That is of any kind of a quality of what you would have out in the world. And if you have any kind of a condition that is made worse by the conditions of your prison cell, for example, if that mattress is terrible for your back, they're not going to get you a fancy mattress. That's just not the way it works. So the question then becomes, again, all of my conservative friends and family would say, well, hey, you don't want to be in there, then don't commit the crime. It's like, okay, so are you saying when you're writing down your ideal prison reform situation that lack of medical care should be part of the punishment, that chronic pain should be part of the punishment, that if you had a chronic disease that you were getting treated on the outside, but now you can't get it treated on the inside, you're saying that you want that codified into the law. And that you, do you want it codified into the law that if sexual assault happens, it happens as part of the punishment? Or do you think that's insane and that everything like that that happens is us a failure as, as a society um, because so much of that is just unquestioned that it's just like no matter what you describe happening to somebody in jail it's always like oh well too bad you know for instance ex wasn't right. jeffrey dahmer like beheaded in prison he was he was beaten to death with a mop handle okay um and you say well you know too, that, that's them doing the system a favor i mean i guess but jeffrey dahmer was insane like, he was completely nuts. He, he had no idea what was going on. The things he did, the things he was... He was trying to create a sex zombie. It, this is not someone who had, like, a healthy, normal brain. It's someone who had a brain injury, frontal lobe injury, or something in childhood, or something equally wrong with him. So, if you want to make the argument that was, like, a mercy killing or whatever, but it sounds like he died in the most horrible way possible, no one felt bad for even one second about that, but it kind of feels like that's just more bad on top of the bad that already occurred. But we don't see it that way. We see it as a, that's like a bill that came due. And I don't know. It's one of the most insane, unexamined thoughts we have. Right, because it comes down to like, well, they didn't sentence them to that. That's not the legal, you know, like and the idea had, that is it, is it this weird unspoken thing that prison could, you could get killed in prison? Because then every time we put someone in jail, we have to be agreeing like that we're also possibly giving them a death sentence, and that's okay. And imagine but, the judge banging the gavel and saying, "I send you to be beaten to death with a broom handle." And in again, the prison that's laundry. Like we would be like, "That's nuts." That judge should be in jail. And again, that's why a lot of judges don't convict young rapists when they should, because their judges are aware. That when they convict someone on like a drug charge, they might be sentencing them to death and they choose whether to care or not. And like if you look at any of the rulings, that's where that comes from, where they're like, ah, he's a young kid. He made one mistake. That's that's basically what they're saying is they're like, no need to ruin this person's life with prison and possibly kill them. And it's like, oh, but like a young kid on a drug charge, that's OK. You know, like, and that's where that, those those situations, why they're so fucked up, because what's built into them is the hidden knowledge that going to prison messes up your life way more than it is designed to or it's supposed to legally. Uh, it's it's yeah. It, it, it's interesting with Dahmer. It was actually he had people had tried to kill him before. Like somebody had right. tried to kill him, I think, earlier that same year, and they didn't do anything about it. Right, and he seems like a real asshole. Right, but yeah, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't sentence him to that. Is the point? Yeah. They didn't say you were sentenced to be beaten to death in prison. So that is a failing. That isn't something where you can go, oh well, he deserved it. It's like no, but that I, shouldn't be happening in prisons. I would argue there are people that are far, far more evil than Jeffrey Dahmer because there are people who kill as a calculated, like, this will make me slightly more money if I kill this person than if I leave oh, yeah. them alive. Whereas Jeffrey Dahmer was not living in reality. Like, this is someone who was from a young age that he had something wrong with him. It's yeah. Like, it's tragic that this is how it manifested, but um, 
but in terms of, of like people who deserve to die, there are there are people, there are very powerful, wealthy people that probably deserve the fate more than <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer does. And some oh, of those people sure. will those some of those people will die in very comfortable beds, getting the finest of care, <laughs> yeah. and will never some pay. Some of them we won't. Yeah, we won't even recognize as a crime. You know. Yeah. It, like you think about like Exxon realizing what they're doing is hurting the environment in like the 60s. It's like, how is that not a crime? You know, how is that not resulting in, in I just, <laughs> the murder of and people? Maybe research how the epi- opioid epidemic started. Again, I'm not yeah. suggesting any specific person <laughs> should be beaten to death with a broom handle. I'm just saying right. that in terms of if, if we faced judgment before God, I think one of these people would say, look, I made the line go up for stockholders this much by 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 addicting all these people in Appalachia to opioids. Yeah, we, by I made a lot thousands. of money. Yeah, I made a lot of, t- telling you know God like, hey, our our shareholders made a lot of money off this. You surely have to take that into account. Whereas Jeffrey Dahmer would be like, I had no idea what was going on. I. I like my my the inside of my head was like a a howling swirl of demons and. I was as surprised by what I did as as anyone. So anyway, but uh, and I think this movie that's very much it intentionally paints a portrait of uh, in that final encounter, which I think is actually very emotional when he has the guy tied up in his saw trap. It's clear I think that the protagonist wants some sign that he got through. Yeah, to he this wants. Guy. He needs something. And Something I, I feel, that, like I've made you feel this. I've made you feel the pain. I've gotten, I've gotten mine back. Like I've gotten my revenge because you are now suffering, and he just can't. He can't like, get I, it from him. I feel like he's even. He, I, I feel like, and I can't. I'm not sure if that's. Uh, I'm interested to see if you guys interpret it the same way. I feel like he might not have necessarily let his parents and son walk in if he had gotten what he wanted out of him at that point. But maybe he would have. Yeah, maybe. Um, it's hard to say yeah Yeah, because when he does leave he doesn't he definitely doesn't feel good about what he knows is going to happen yeah you know Mm -hmm. and to be clear he leaves like his little tracker his little bug there so he can listen to it happen yeah (laughs) as he walks away and listens to it on his his little earbuds and uh it is that is the final like deranged it is one when you think the movie is going to let you go and you think okay we finally reached the end it's like this final deranged button that it hits you with it's like yeah. if you did not yet feel bad <laughs> watch this movie yeah. uh, we got one more we got one more trick in, in store for you because as far as you think this guy is going to go as far as you think he's willing to go he's got one more he's got one more level he's going to hit and I it's think just it's- it, I, I agree. Like in the past, you know, we, the conversation we'd having for the past twenty minutes, I do think that this is an this movie is an interesting exploration of that mentality of like, absolutely, we, we've always got to be punished. We have to punish him. It's like, well, it's if they don't, it, like, what good is that? Yeah, yeah. It, this movie, I think, is a good exploration yeah. of that. How do you again? How do you punish something that is uh, uh, evil or unstoppable or isn't fully aware of what it's doing? Like that's that's all what this is the ending scene. It's he's he's got the blue well, and, balls. And, and then the and the point he, is at the he's, end, he's just like he can't. There's no satisfaction here. Even if you do get the response you wanted, like um, I don't want to keep hitting on on Dahmer, but like when he was sentenced, the judge let the families of some of his victims speak to him. And uh, invariably, they were asking him questions like, why? Why did you do it? And they couldn't get a satisfying answer out. He would just tell them, I, right. don't, I don't know. Like, so it's like there's no, even if you do get the response you wanted, like when, he's, when, he, when the detective is fucking this guy up for the whole movie, obviously he wants this guy to feel physical pain. But it's still, even, even in that situation where he's getting what he wants, it's not, it's not helping. It's not, it doesn't feel right. like justice. You know? And obviously, not all criminals are dumber. Some of them right. shoot shoot wealthy parents outside an opera mm-hmm. or a theater yeah. and create Batman. But it's out of desperation, you know. Like, that, but that's what this specific movie is using the worst case scenario, which is a dumber, someone who is just simply you can't. Yeah, you can't do that. It's not going to work. Uh, this is a sociopath. They're never going to feel the remorse you want them to feel. And that's yeah. why I would like at this point, um, just I know we, we, we do have to wrap up fairly soon, but I would I do want to pivot and 
thoroughly discuss uh, Todd Phillips' Joker film. Yeah, 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 let's do it. Yeah. Um, because this is something that I may have discussed on this podcast or one of the 30 other podcasts that I guessed on. That I kind of hated that movie because I hated it. <laughs> oh, I super that, hated it, Jason, but go on. That he pivoted to, oh, see, the Joker is just a victim of the system and he can't get social services and he's been, people have made fun of him his whole life and he's got, you know, weird mental problems. And so that's why he became the Joker. And I feel like that's actually such a betrayal of that character because the whole deal with the Joker is that he's not a sad sack loser who's abused by society. He just freaking loves being the Joker. Right. That was why Heath Ledger's Joker worked so well, where they're like, he's got no ID. We don't know where he came from. He keeps telling a different origin story. He even says, like, this is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, where he's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm the Joker, baby. I'm the Joker, That's baby. It. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he loves it. He doesn't apologize. Uh, he yeah. doesn't. He, he's not sad. And whenever it, it's important that when he tells, like, the story of his traumatized past with his with his father abusive father and then he tells another story and you're always oh he just made it up yeah right it's like he doesn't it's like no he's not he's not broken he's he loves being the joker it he's it's it's great he's having a great time right. and that's you can that's, you, yeah that's why he's you, the ultimate test of batman's like don't no kill policy because if the joker was this sad broken product of the system well that'd be very easy it's like well of course no this guy if anything this guy needs medication like, you know, that, right. that that Joker just needs help. He needs therapy. The Joker of, of the comics and the cartoons, the, one, the movies that I've seen, is like, no, there's no therapy that's going to fix the Joker. He he loves what he's doing. He He's fully himself. He knows exactly what he's doing. He he doesn't believe in morality. He doesn't, you know, it, it's not because he's, he's sick. Right. And so, I don't know, I felt like it's crossing a line by making that the portrait of him. Because it's almost trivializing, I don't know. Because he's, he's a, supposed um, to be a goofy comic book character. Like that's that's the whole thing. Yeah, the Joker. I would, I, you know, you can argue it's not the best portrayal of a murderer, um, but this does bring up something uh, that's worth mentioning. Uh, I don't want to get us on another tangent, but you can look up studies. Uh, most uh, like spree killers, uh, people making the news. They don't actually have mental health issues or not diagnosed issues. Like, I think we have, and you go back and you look at, like, the Nazis and stuff like that. This is, uh, we're working on a Some More News, uh, um, or uh, Some More News, uh, I think I think it would have come out by now. Uh, it, it, it touched on this, which is that, like, we, we love to say, like, this is a mental illness issue with a lot of stuff. But, like, you can do horrific things and be completely sound of mind too. Uh, and I think that's important to note. And again, it's that idea of like, how do you reform that? How do you reform someone who just hates a, a type of people? You know, like it, it, there are these immovable objects where it's like, yeah, you kind of like just have to put them in jail. Like, and, and like there is, there are people where it's just like, there's nothing we can do with this. They're just hateful. There is something that you could define. I don't want to use the word evil because it's weird, but like it's it's very much in line with this movie, which is that yeah, this guy seems very fucked up, but he it's also kind of like the Joker, where the Joker is just like yeah, this is just what I do. Like there's no there's no nothing more complex to it. Yeah, and, and so I think there's something to be said about that. Yeah, not to not get not way off the subject, but the whenever there's a mass shooting, then the media points out where well, well, you know, he had autism. I yeah, it's do like, not. I that do doesn't not like cause that. you to shoot people. That is not one of the symptoms of autism is mass shooting. Like that's no. that's uh, you may it may be overlapping with a lot of other things that went wrong in their life, but that's always bugged me because I think Adam Lanza right. wasn't that the primary thing. It's like, well, you know, he was autistic. Like, okay, um, yeah, and people uh, that doesn't explain how, as a society, we keep cranking out people that will specifically get an AR-15 and a high-capacity pistol and a tactical vest and go shoot a crowd. Like, that's not right. that's not an autism thing. That's a that's a stew of things that make that, make, that make us pre-killer. Right. But, like, surprisingly rarely is it about mental illness. People with mental illness, we all kind of know this, this is statistically more likely to be victims. 
uh, uh, there's been yeah very few documented cases. There's the 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 Texas Tower shooter who had a brain tumor, but there's actually a lot of debate around whether or not that yeah. tumor actually affected his behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will never of, know. No, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing we will never know. Uh, but it, it yeah, and it, it's in most mass shootings, in most the majority of them, the only symptom of mental illness is that they committed a mass shooting. Like, that, I would guess that probably right. is a symptom. But in terms of previously diagnosed, and the ones who were diagnosed, is things like depression. Right. Which but everyone again, has. It's, it's that idea is if you are, you know, uh, releasing an opioid to a bunch of people resulting in deaths, uh, are you, that's a mass killing. Are you, do you have a mental illness? Like, that idea of yeah, how we define these things. Yeah, or do you just, not care? Yeah. Yeah. Or or just you want just to make care. the line an go asshole. up? Yeah. And so that's, that's, I don't know, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, I wouldn't but t- the, get back to the movie. <laughs> well, no, but I, I, yeah, that's what really, said, that's this, movie, this movie definitely invokes all that stuff. Yes, God, what a sp- such a spooky episode we're that, doing right now. That's why I brought this, that's why I recommended this movie for this episode, because I do yeah. love those themes. If it was just a, a demonstration of some cool fight scenes, some very good makeup effects, some spectacular blood, practical blood and wound effects. If it was just that, I would have forgotten about it five minutes later. But mm-hmm. it clearly was not just that. It is a long movie. It, it's a movie where he catches the bad guy 45 minutes into it, and you think, boy, that's awfully early for him to be catching the bad guy. And then you realize, oh, oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> and it, the, everything right. that plays out after that. There's conversations, there's arguments about between people, there's people begging him to stop, and they touch directly on this. We are not reading too much into this movie. It's explicitly what it's about. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it was any less gross, if it was any less mean, if I saw a censored version, I even resent the the 90 seconds they made them trim it because I think, no. Yeah. No, this should be, this should make you feel terrible. Like, you should not enjoy watching any of the violence. It's the only yeah. responsible way to have that conversation, I think. Yeah, the is, not you feel in your stomach after watching this movie is the manifestation of everything we're talking about. Yes. Whether or not you are aware of it watching the movie, that is the point of the movie, is to make you feel conflicted uh, about these ideas because they are conflicting ideas. Yeah. Because there are natural emotional need for revenge that we all probably have, you know, unless we're a monk. Uh, most people are like to the little point where someone cuts you off in traffic, you know, yeah. you want something to happen to that person. It's, it's almost it, like it a, just comes naturally to us. We we're shitty animals. It's uh, almost like a biological paradox almost. Cause it's, you do yeah. have that. It's just like, well, no, fuck that. Fuck that guy. He can't be out there buying shoes. He, you know, he killed right. my brother or whatever. There right. has to be some evolutionary biology into it or evolutionary psychology rather into it, where it's like we made, tribal living work because we have instincts that if somebody's breaking the rules of the tribe like that's they have to be you know they have to be Punished, total less than yeah. what it, like like the ones who didn't have that instinct those tribes fell apart and they didn't pass on their genes or whatever i'm a big believer that a lot of the irrational impulses are handed down from an era when it was actually fine to smash somebody's head in with a rock they used to make you chief if you did that <laughs> like hey you're the best at smashing people with a rock you, so you, you got know, promoted <laughs> Yeah, you've been promoted. Uh, and, and now we, we it's, I think, in our cultural evolution, it's shockingly recent that you couldn't, uh, that you, you couldn't, they, when two people are arguing that it wasn't just assumed that it would descend into uh, one guy smashing another guy with a rock. Right. Like those urges to do it, I feel like that's very natural and it's part of modern society is trying to r- restrain those because it you're that part of your brain comes roaring back in the moment you have been wrong it's like no no it, it's like no you i was waiting in line at the drive through you nosed your car in like no I, I realize this is literally nothing in my life this will only delay me getting my food by one minute and we will say it is the principle of the thing it's like well what, <laughs> right. what principle what what principle is that because i think the principle is just a primal urge to make this person feel pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you want a movie that will, that will examine that in a way that will make you feel worse, I highly recommend. <laughs> I saw the devil on yeah. available on streaming. If you are squeamish about violence or gore in movies at all, do not come within 100 yards of this film. Yep. Here's, here's what I think you should do. You, you kids having a Halloween party, 
slip this on you know <laughs> yeah Get, do, do the thing where you do the 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 grapes without skin and they blindfold you do that you do you do some spooky stuff yeah. and then you you, you, the, you put you, this on you do the monster mash and then you put on i yep. saw the devil yeah <laughs> uh, all right well any any all right any other final thoughts no nah, uh, it's just just that this is i think this is a really good movie it's it's i think the most unique revenge movie i've ever seen um it's it's very well done very well made and obviously there's a a, there it lingers it leaves you with a whole lot to think about we've been talking about it for the past 90 minutes so yeah yeah, that says horror should do that i feel like horror should good horror should linger i i feel like most uh, so many of the modern horror movies that are jump scares that kind of thing they don't stick with you and that's fine it's meant so you know you've seen the audience reactions to like the first paranormal activity movie and people are kind of watching it they're kind of like looking at their phones at the same time but then there's a jump scare and they go ah and their popcorn flies everywhere and it's like a little it's like a little roller coaster ride at a a carnival where it's like the little scary things pop out at you and then then you come out of the end of it and you walk away and you totally forget about it uh, but occasionally you should watch a horror movie and you walk away saying, hey, this that movie made my life slightly worse than it was before. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want I want them to do an ad with the audience reaction night vision where they all just look like they're processing 9-11. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. people yeah. quietly watching this movie. It has yeah. like this schoolgirl tied up on the ground and you think, oh, well, he'll the hero will come in and rescue right. him before this guy's able. And he just keeps. That keeps, keeps not going. happening for a long, long time. And, yeah. and um, <laughs> yeah, because again, that would, that's not the kind of movie you're watching. This is not, right. this is not a world in which the hero always swoops in right before somebody gets hurt. This is a world in which people will get hurt and they will remain hurt for the rest of their lives if they survive. Yep. Spooky stuff. Yeah. It was spooktacular. Uh, Happy yeah. Halloween, everybody. <laughs> <Yep>. Happy <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> Oh, all right. Jason, thank you so much for being on yeah, here. Yeah, thank you. I, I know you discussed it at the beginning, but would you like to to plug some stuff here at the end? Yep. The book I am trying to get people to buy is called If This Book Exists, You're in the Wrong Universe. It is part of a series of novels. You, If you've seen the movie John Dies at the End, this is the fourth book in that series. They are not serialized. You can watch, you can read any book by itself, and they all make perfect the, the exact same amount of sense. They don't all make perfect sense. They all equally don't make sense no matter what order you read them in. They are episodic. So if you've not l- listened to or read any of the books, you can start with this one. Although that would be weird because this would be the most expensive one since it just came out. It would be make much more sense to get one of the other ones from a used bookstore or a library. But obviously... I want you to buy this one <laughs> since this is the one that just came out. Right. Otherwise, if you want to keep up with me, my name is Jason Pargin, P-A-R-G-I-N. Type that name into any social media platform, including TikTok. You are We're, killing it on TikTok. You're a TikTok killing influencer, it. Jason. I'm a TikTok influencer. Mo- for, first and foremost, I write my novels on the side, primarily. Right. If you want, if you're a brand and you want me to sell your items on TikTok, I'll do it. I don't even care. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to do it, Fuck actually. It. Yeah, I am. I am here to sell out. It is. There is no other reason to be on any of these platforms unless you're selling something. If you're doing it just for a hobby, man, please find another hobby. Mm-hmm. These th- these algorithms will ruin your brain. Yes, I've been on TikTok now, and it's just a scroll machine, and I can't stop. Yeah, uh, it is. It is both delightful and disturbing, like this movie. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll tell people about our Patreon. Yeah, delightful, delightful, the poster disturbing. for I Saw the Devil. Just one word, delightful, in quotes. <laughs> 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 That's your pull quote. Yeah. A little picture of your face down there. <laughs> delightful. Give it a thumbs up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Click in your heels. Uh, <laughs> Uh, listen, folks, we, ha- we, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed, G-A-M-E-F-U-L-O-Y, unemployed. Uh, you get uh, for just $5 a month, five of your dollars a month, less than a movie ticket, you get al- hours, hours of content on there. I hate calling it content. We all hate calling it content, but mm-hmm. I did it. Uh, some exclusive podcasts there like Tom and Jeff Watch Batman, Fox Mulder is a Maniac, Star Trek The Next Futurama, and Spiel Boys. Mm. Uh, those are all f- bi-weekly shows, I believe. There's a bunch of them. 
Oh no, Tom and Jeff Watch Batman is a weekly show. Tons of content. Five dollars a month. For ten dollars a month, we also watch movies with our patrons every Friday night. There's other tiers as well, where you can have custom we just watched episodes done. A lot of stuff on there. Check it out, please. We probably will not watch this movie on a movie night. <laughs> <laughs> probably not probably You're not. right um we also have a store head over to gameplayunemployed.com you'll find a link to our teespring store we have all kinds of cool original artwork and designs you can get on t-shirts stickers mugs posters all sorts of things so slap your devil peepers on that if yeah. you want yeah yeah and your, uh, your just devil uh, peeping peepers yeah and uh i guess a plug for the devil you know it's it's that yeah. time of year it's his season he's the reason for the season <laughs> yeah so go uh, support whatever Satan you uh, you like best, I guess. Yeah, go celebrate Sam Hain or you know yeah. whatever. All right, yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> we can right. we can be done. 